And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Dr. Rebecca Hardcastle Wright, lifelong ET contactee, futurist, author, and founder of the Institute for Exoconsciousness. She was also a member of Apollo 14 astronaut Dr. Edgar Mitchell's Quantrek International Science Team, researching consciousness, the ET presence, and zero-point energy. Rebecca, thank you for joining me today, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Can you give us a little bit about your background being an ET contactee? Sure. Um, I'm what's called a childhood contactee. Uh, So my first cognitive awareness of being contacted was around the age of three years old, which is a very common age for contactees. Um, However, there are, I just want to parenthetically say that there are contactees that were also aware of coming in as a contactee before they were born, so before they inc- incarnated, as well as um, as a crib con- contactee. So you're saying you agreed to do this pre-birth? I don't have conscious memories of that, but there are people who do. I have conscious memories of it starting for me around the age of three. That's, but around the age of three is when you develop your, cog- your your cognitive abilities. I was wondering if so many children are contacted at that early age is because they have less fear. Absolutely. Um, so when you're a childhood contactee, um, you it's it's just part of your life. You don't you you're you're, you're not you're not analytical enough to start to separate out what doesn't belong in, in reality. You're, um, well, from from in utero to three years old, as a therapist, I know that we're just a sponge. So we're just sponging up whatever comes to us. And then at three years old, we start to say that, oh, you know, I'm aware of this, I'm aware of that. But awareness doesn't equal um, analytical abilities. That comes a, a, a bit later of, um, you know, I'll take this and I don't want that. But yeah, it's, it was always, um, it, it just flowed in this easy continuum. And it was funny, I was I was working with um, Bob Davis, who's a consciousness researcher at Ohio State University, um, Dr. Davis. Mm-hmm. He's, um, he's doing a movie on consciousness and um, has written a book on it. And he was, he was interviewing me and I said something like I was a childhood contactee. And he said to me, oh, you've never known anything different. So there are those of us who have never known anything different. This is just part of our being. And then there are people that are adult contactees. But I found in my work as as an exoconscious coach with individuals and with groups that the people who are adult contactees are oftentimes also just not remembering that they were childhood contactees. I guess you were the type of child that was considered to have an imaginary friend. Actually, I never, my brother who's passed, who passed away very young, he, he spoke of it as imaginary friends, but I never did. I, I, I just thought that they were part of my life. I didn't do that separation. Um, So I grew up in a, a very small town and at the time still is, but in West Virginia called Clarksburg, West Virginia. Uh, it's a mining community, so it's full of holes, <laughs> you know, porous underground. Maybe and it's that. also full of a lot of um, mountain people, Celtic people that um, immigrated there and worked in the mines and worked in the forestry service and that sort of thing. And because it was so small, I had a lot of freedom. So I basically could go out the door, be gone for the day. and. Um, And some of my contact came during the day, like I was picked up during the day. Um, And and I was familiar with craft as a child. Also, I had uh, very vivid memories of childhood visitation in in my bedroom. So I had both the daylight and and the bedroom kind of um, contact. So I was going what I perceived as 
into a craft in space. But interestingly enough, as a contactee, I was also going under the ground. So I was being pulled under the ground by bees at the same time. When you say underground, that makes me think of reptilians. I think some were absolutely reptilians, but I never had the feeling that they were anything of a threat to me. But I had a very, it was a a very different kind of contact. So underground had a very visceral feeling, like my body was very engaged in this, pulling under, being under the ground, being with these bees, being in this dimension, and then and then coming up out of the ground as being that's kind of like a that very visceral. The the, the contact on the craft seemed a lot more subtle. If physically it felt more subtle to me than the underground. Um work. And I, I didn't realize until I was much older, actually an adult, when I realized I was living in Phoenix, I was sitting on on the porch of my condo one day. And I was reading a book on shamanism. And I'm like, oh, that's what I was doing. Like I was working with earth energies as a child. I was a shaman. So there must have been some reason that I came in to do this earth energies work with these with these beings and with and that there was a very definite connection between what I was going through underground and once again I didn't have analytical ability to ferret this out but there was a connection between what was happening to me under the ground and what was happening to me in in the craft that these two were connected and I was somehow this third party did the contact continue throughout your life or did you have a lot of contact as a child and then it stopped and then it came back again later my contact intensified probably until about fifth or sixth grade sixth grade for sure because i think that's when you move more into your peer group so um i think that it lessened for me because my attention wasn't there my attention was to the other people in my sixth grade not to you started not, not to the beans you started yeah. noticing boys and that was it huh <laughs> right and other girls like what what are they wearing like how are they doing their hair you know all of that but then there was there was kind of a um like I, I went in and out with my contact but it was more of a sort of a just, just kind of this gentle wave of contact and then not contact and then for sure um, I'm a mom. So when I started having children, I mean, you know what that's like. That's yeah. like that's where your attention is. Tensions yeah. with your children. And and you know, but there were sort of bleed throughs of of knowledge at that part, point. Like I was always extremely psychic. I always knew what was happening. And then when I was um probably uh, like mid 40s. Um, I I was divorced and I was a single parent and I was raising the, my children by myself alone. And um, my ex-husband had left at that point and um, and wasn't around. So I was under all this pressure to like be a single mom, raise my children. And interestingly enough, even in that extreme pressure cooker there, because I lived in Phoenix, so all my family's like in Ohio. And I'm in, and I'm in Phoenix, which is thousands of miles away. And during that time, a lot, many, many things, Jeff, that ha- happened to me in childhood, resurfaced again in adulthood in a much more um, intense way than had ever happened before as a child. So that's kind of how you can look at childhood. I was just moving with it flowing with it. It was happening. I wasn't afraid. I liked what was happening. (laughs) And then adulthood where it just intensified and uh, and until there were points of it where the beings actually came back and said, okay, you learned this once, you need to learn it again. Being a lifelong contactee and a coach, do you think 
the contact had any factor on your divorce? And if not yours, do you think it has factors on anybody other any other contactees personal relationships well my personal divorce is based on um bless his heart my ex-husband was an alcoholic <laughs> okay i mean i i think that i i would have i would have stayed in it had that not been there um but now was this part of actually sort of sort of you know you hear the initiation stories of the people in the amazon where they they paint their faces white and they crawl through the, the logs and they come out the other end and they're a new person i would have to say that i probably spent 10 years crawling through that log mm -hmm. <laughs> to come out the other person now you know whether that had to do with my contact or that was an agreement that i had in my life script um i don't think it was due to contact i think it was due to the fact that um, this was part of my blueprint that I had to go through. I had to struggle. I had, I had to struggle with this and I had to decide which world was I going to be a citizen of? Was I going to be a citizen of the 3D world or was I going to be a citizen of in my adulthood raising my children? Or was I going to be a citizen of the 3D world, the underworld, the fourth dimension, the fifth dimension, the ninth dimension, and that's what I chose because the beings were there. I was familiar with them. There's also um, uh, Ralph Ring that wrote The Omega Project. I don't know if you're familiar with his book. He was at University of Connecticut. I'm not. That fascinating guy. Um, one of the things that he wrote about was that young children who are contactees have an innate trust in the beings that they're con connected to. So I had a base, I had I had a trust in beings under the ground and beings in the craft at the same time. And the beings that would come and visit me in my bedroom. I trusted them because we had, I always say trust is continuity over time. I'd had a continuity over time with these beings and then when I was going through this period of, of divorce and being a single parent, I always say, if you can be a single parent in Phoenix, Arizona, you can be a Phoenix, single Because at that time, it was like, I don't know, 70% men lived here. It was mm. really kind of a man's golfing paradise, less so today. But um, so I think as Ralph commented, these children have a trust in that, in those, those extra dimensional, interdimensional, extraterrestrial beings, we, we trust them. And so it was made sense for me to go, to go and trust that. Then when I hit this other point in my life, I would say. Do you think that you have an implant so they can keep tabs on you? I think that I have had implants. I don't anymore. I had one massive implant that was up clear like one side of my face are you still having contact even today and if so how does that contact happen yes i still have contact today and the reason i still have contact today is because i i call myself an exoconscious human i i choose to live an interdimensional life I choose to have, um, so exoconsciousness is the innate. So I would say every human has this ability. They have the innate human ability to connect, communicate, and co-create with extraterrestrials, multidimensionals, and spiritual beings, angels, for example, archangels, for example. Like I've had visitations by not just ETs, I've had visitations by angels, by archangels. And so for, for me, that's, a, that's an intentional consciousness choice that I made in my life. But it's also as a result of what happened to me in my childhood. So are you saying that, or at least we all have the ability to be exoconscious? Yes. How do we do that? Well, it's just like we do anything else. Um, we have to learn about it. We have to practice it. I mean, there's all kinds of, um, I would say, gateways 
into becoming exoconscious. I mean, you could you could go through the yoga gateway, you could go through the meditation gateway. Um, some people do, um, you know, psychedelic drugs. I'm not really an advocate for that because I think it's it's a little disturbing. Mm -hmm. um, some people um, just dive into it mentally, start reading books, start watching videos, start talking to other people that are contactees. They just have an interest in it. And that's that's just you know that's 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 your first step. Is it kind of like the CE five where we have to try to initiate contact? Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. So I call CE five. So CE five is so CE four was um, Jacques Vallée. CE four was um, I'm going to there's that there's some kind of knowledge that's that's in folklore and in, in myth and legend that relates to who I am consciously. So my underground experiences could be, you know, I could understand them if I went into the folklore of the fairy people, for example, okay? Um, CE5 would be um, um, Stephen Greer, where he's talking about consciousness, that, that, that we, have a con we have this conscious connection with the craft, okay? And that it's going to be a mutually agreeable um, thing that I see the craft. For exoconscious humans, that would be what I call CE6. So those are humans that are saying, I don't necessarily need a craft. That's one path I could take. Um, I don't necessarily need these, these, um, these stories and legends and myths that have always been, you know, all of these help me. But I stand as an exoconscious human in my own sovereign moral consciousness of who I am as a person. And that puts me on a very different level with extraterrestrials. So we believe that our extraterrestrial connections or our connections with multidimensionals or spiritual beings, that those are a peer-to-peer -peer relationship. It's not a stratified, I'm I'm in kindergarten and you're in, in the master class. You know, you're, you're, that's not the master. It's kind of like, it's, it's this equality of, you know, I'm participating in this conscious universe with, with you beings. And I, as a human, have not only the right, but I would go a step further. I would say you have the responsibility to set boundaries and to say what works for you and what doesn't work for you. Okay, so you're peer to peer. And when you get that figured out, then you step into that, you know, what I think is just the miracle of creation, you start co-creating with these beings. Before we started recording, I, I mentioned I wanted to talk to you about some things. And what I wanted to talk to you about is I'm having more and more guests have the ability to make contact kind of like CE5. And I've even had one guest call it CE6. I don't know if you know of a person named John Martin. He's a professional classical guitarist. And I think after meeting with President Carter, he became inspired to try to make contact. So he would go outside and play classical pieces and while playing them, try to project himself into the universe. And now I'm guessing it's crafts, but crafts show up, he videos them all the time and he gets all this content. Like I said previously, that other guests are able to get craft to show up, but is it really craft or are they like orbs or beings? And what would classify the difference between that as being CE5 or CE6? Um, I think the approach is different. Um, CE5 has always been very much of an out there approach. So we're looking up, it's gonna come in from out there, okay? Exoconscious CE6 is I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna go inward and it's gonna come inward and then go outward. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very, very different orientation. So one of the first, um, things that we do in exoconscious coaching, whether it's one-on-one or, one -on -one or in our groups, is that we start to integrate. 
So, so trauma is a big, is, is, is a big trigger for a lot of people who are contactees. They were traumatized. Oftentimes they're adults. They get very traumatized by it. They're very sensitive people. They're very psychic people. They're aware that something's happened to them. And this, this trauma spills over into, you know, physical illnesses, hospitalizations, a, a, a mental illness. And so step one for us is get, get, get your house in order. Um, heal from whatever those wounds are that are triggering you and not allowing you to move into this, this place of peace within yourself. So we call that integration. So once that integrative function, that going inward, um, trusting, that's that's all about the struggle of learning to trust yourself. And it's, it's a struggle. So I go in, I learn to trust myself, and then I begin to go outward and bring in a very, very different dimensional awareness than if I just take all my wounds, take all my fears, take all my trauma, and just sit and look at the sky. Do you believe that all the beings out there, whether they're ETs or multidimensional, which to me kind of is the same thing, are they all benevolent? I don't think they're all benevolent. I do think that there's other beings that have um, um, a role to play in the construction of the universe that I personally don't understand, that I think have oftentimes been level, labeled demonic. I would say that, you know, we, I was I was active and um, I wrote a chapter for um, Ray Hernandez's free organization, um, the Beyond UFOs book. And 70% of that, those surveyed from around 100 countries, I think there's 5,000 5, surveys now in, in 100 countries, over 70% said uh, they would do it again. And they liked it and it was benevolent. That's a big number. Well, that's what makes me wonder. Are they all really benevolent? They're just misunderstood. That could be. That could be. One of the, one of the things, so I'm... Um, one of your things your listeners should probably know is that, so I went to, um, um, I had my master's in philosophical, philosophical theology. So I went to seminary. So I was a, a United Methodist minister mm. for years. I was the chaplain at Rice State University in Dayton, Ohio as an ecumenical chaplain. And um, so I know religious history. And one of the high points of religious history, you know, we kind of gloss over, but the Reformation in terms of human development, of human consciousness, was highly significant because Martin Luther, who was a Catholic priest, stood back and said, you know, wait a minute, you know, we don't really have to pay this money to the church for our salvation. You know, we really don't have to do all these regulatory ritualistic things that he proposed, which was incredibly radical, um, a priesthood of all believers. So Jeff is a priest. Rebecca is a priest. It's the same thing. Actually, I'm saying in exoconsciousness, we're all exoconscious. We all have access to God. We all have access to these beings. It's whether or not we want to actually live into that, into that access or not. I chose to live into the access and trust it. Can you tell us more how you co-create with them? Sure. So maybe this is a good time to talk about Dr. Mitchell. Sure. Okay. So I, one of the things I do in my coaching is I, at one point, I always tell people, sit down. I don't care how you do it. You can draw it. You can write it. But do your exoconscious autobiography. Talk, you know, write down where you lived, what you were doing. What, what kind of people were you around and how does that relate to your exoconsciousness and start it back as early as you can. So my first book was called exoconsciousness, your 21st century mind. And I had just written what was not just my, my exoconscious autobiography of where I was in my contact childhood, adulthood, that sort of thing. 
but it was also looking at consciousness in a scientific way. And I had just published the book and I was at my first conference to introduce, kind of do a book launch kind of thing, a uh, very small thing, but <laughs> to do a book launch. And no sooner had I done that book launch than I got a call from um, the astronaut, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, to come and work with his Quantrek group. And so in Quantrek, we were, the priority was zero point energy, but it was also um, zero point energy, consciousness, and the extraterrestrial presence. So in other words, it's sort of like, if you think about in Christian terms, like that would be a trinity. Like you can't have one without the other. If you don't have the ET piece, you're not going to have zero point energy. If you don't have consciousness understanding, you're not going to have zero point energy. If you don't have zero point energy, you're not really going to understand the ET piece or consciousness. So it's sort of this free flowing um, trinity, trinitarian kind of concept that we were developing. And as I was working with them, I I, um, I, I got a chance to work with a lot of um, you know very esteemed scientists working at working in that area, and I began to see objectively through them how they use their exoconsciousness to bring forth these these inventions. Now, make no mistake, I was working with Dr. Mitchell not because I was a scientist. Now, I I, I understand science, but it's lay layperson's perspective. But I was asked to participate because I'm a contactee. So he had a lot of a high respect for contact for contactees. And so I saw I saw these scientists and how how their spirituality and their consciousness and their their contact and their psychic contact and the downloads that they received. I saw how that worked for them and I knew how it was working for me. So for Dr. Mitchell, I would get a I get a paper, like a you know, paper with a lot of math in it and a lot of science in it, con con concepts. I'd read the paper, I go to bed at night, I get downloads, I wake up in the morning and I understood the paper. Hmm. That's co-creation. That is me. That's my consciousness going out kind of in a Rupert Sheldrake morphogenic field way. I'm going out into the field of consciousness and I am there. There is some kind of dynamic process taking place that I am being imbued with knowledge. And so you could take that. Personally, I take that to another another point and I say I say okay what if I intentionally say I want I want knowledge about a Pleiadian um, concept I want knowledge about healing in an Octurian concept and I am asking for that to be given to me because because I need that for my work that's that's peer-to-peer co-creation so that's not, that's very different than, a, Jeff, that's a very different than like a, 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 a me lab, a military contact or an abduction kind of contact where you just get swept away and, you know, you're just sort of helpless at the hands of beings. That's a very different, much more human centric, powerful method. And it's my strong belief that if we humans don't get this piece, it's kind of like the Reformation. This is a door. Like we can walk through with this piece, but it can't all be about illness and trauma and wounds and fear and the black helicopters are going to come and they're going to come get me. You know, you're just totally in this victim stance all the time. You're not going to see and feel and use your power. Practical application of what you're saying, for example, could I have last night before I go to bed said, you know, I'm going to be with Rebecca tomorrow. Can you give me information, download, so I can have a better conversation with her? 
Perfect. Perfect. You, you're the one instigating it. It's, it's, it, it, it kind of goes back to, you know, Bill Tiller's work and uh, pH, like consciousness changing the pH of water. Have you read about that? I think I know of it. Yeah. So it's kind of like taking that experiment. So Bill um, is actually here, was here in Phoenix. So he, he ran experiments where human intention changed the pH balance in the water. And so it's kind of like taking that to a greater application. It's like that's kind of the microscopic and kind of going to the macroscopic. Like I'm, I am, I need these things. I know that I'm an interdimensional being, that I have a peer to peer relationship and I need information and I need help. And then when it comes to trust it, and sometimes it means you have to wait too. Sometimes it doesn't come right away. Yeah. I experiment quite a bit with manifesting. And right now I think that I've come to the conclusion that it takes a little time before it comes into reality. I also want to I just, just add into this to get this. This would sort of do another layer for you and your listeners. So. There's a woman that um, I worked with in the Institute for Exoconsciousness, Darlene Vandegrift, who does really wonderful work. And she works with 20 some extraterrestrial beings and she works with what she calls renegades. So renegades are beings that belong to certain ET races, but no longer are identifying morally or ethically with what's happening with their race. And so she is a human. Helps them change their timeline. Do you think that there are ETs in our 3D realm walking around here on the planet unknown? Absolutely. I I, if, 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 you know, how many, how many near-death experiencers have you interviewed? How many people that have seen ghosts have you interviewed? I mean, are we just going to leave out this whole other dimension? Yeah. I keep telling my audience I want to get one on the show. Well, I think um, I, I, I think as we exoconscious humans begin to see that that's who we are, that probably all these people you've had on the show are the beings. You have a book that's called Exoconsciousness Humans Will Free Will Survive in an Increasingly Non-Human World? And in that book, you write about transhumanism. What's the difference between that and exoconsciousness? Okay, so a little backstory in that. Um, so I was working with Dr. Mitchell in, um, in DC and um, just a little historical notes. So I was, I was, I was the Washington DC representative. So I was living in Washington DC and I, I was making contact with the Obama White House and I was making contact with John Podesta, particularly at the Obama White House and saying, um, uh, that Dr. Mitchell and I would like to meet with him. Actually, we wanted to meet with Obama, but I knew mm -hmm. the doorway of John Podesta was much more reasonable opportunity. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I wrote to him and um, and I set up the meeting. And John Podesta was very, very accommodating. It was like the, I think the week of August 11th. He was wanted Edgar to come up, and we could go to the uh, White House and meet with him. And Edgar couldn't go. He'd been in Europe. He'd been, he, he was in, I didn't realize it, but he was in a wheelchair the whole time he was in Europe. He got back and it was even more debilitating for him. And he just, he couldn't make the trip. He couldn't come. And he really wasn't even able to do, you know, a Zoom or anything like that. And so at that point, I, I knew that. And so all of that subsequently then came out in WikiLeaks. Came out in the John Podesta, my my, all my John Podesta emails came out of WikiLeaks. So, so at that point, I'm like, I'm at a crossroads and I'm like, okay, I just, you know, Edgar, I, this contract work, it's, it's, I need to move on. And actually, after he passed over, actually sent, I, do, do you know Kevin Briggs? The name seems familiar, but yeah, not really. Yeah, he does the Council of Eight. Yeah, he's cool. He'd be a great guest. Mm. I can help. Thank you. I'll put that so, down. Yeah. Um, so Kevin does not know me, nor do I know Kevin. This is years ago. This is like 2016 or 
it was after the WikiLeaks, but Kevin reached out to me, he goes, Edgar Mitchell came into me. I don't know Edgar Mitchell, but he came into me and he had a message for you and he wants you to leave DC. It's not a good place for you to be. You need to leave DC. And my husband and I had been in the process. So all this time, I all these years then, these few years I'd been, you know, when you live in Washington, DC, you know, it's just a lot of thinking going on there, a lot of activity, a lot of government grants. And people kept dropping information on me about transhumanism. And being a mother, I was like, whoa, now. <laughs> it's like, whoa, like what's going on here? <laughs> and uh, and just doing a very, you know, I write about it in my book. It was just like, it, it, it was like a, a lap drop. They would just drop it in my lap, but like, Here's this information. And I go to yoga class and people would tell me things. I'm like, this is just crazy. And so um, I got so worried and disturbed about transhumanism, which I'll define in a second, that it really took me moving back to Phoenix. And that made me two moves in Phoenix to get my trauma body back and calm down from all of the depth of research that I had done. And I knew even, I knew at that point in like 2018, 2019, 2020, I knew COVID was coming. I knew all these things that are happening. I knew then they were all going to happen. And the book publisher said, I'll publish your book, but nobody in like 2021 or whatever, it goes, nobody's going to read it for three years. It's just going to, they're just not going to be able to read it. I'm like, well, just publish it anyway. We'll just go for it. So transhuman, I've already described exoconsciousness. So transhumanism, so, so exoconscious, that innate human ability to connect, communicate, and co-create with ETs, multidimensionals, and spiritual beings is a path for human advancement. But what it requires is natural human consciousness. So our body... Our body has meridians. Our body has third eye. Our body has chakras. Our body has this, this ability to spatially feel and move with heightened sensory awareness. So um, I, I see, I can see different things. I can hear different things. I can, I can actually feel these energies around me. And that is what allows me to connect to these beings. So I need that. I need that hardware inside of me. My DNA, my frequency. We can talk about DNA frequency if you want to. Also, so my DNA is also connecting with these beings. Now, a transhuman is of the belief that my system is incomplete. My system is flawed. My system really is. Um, rather archaic and going nowhere. And I need to extend myself and advance myself only through artificial intelligence, implants, um, you know, neural link, um, DNA, change my DNA, that that's, that's how I'm going to advance. It's by technologically altering myself to become uh, a cyborg human. So that would then be diminishing what an exoconscious human would need. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. What did you mean more about DNA and frequency? Well, I don't know exactly how all this works, but I've been I've been working a lot with uh, plasma science. So plasma science is, well, let's give an example how big it is. So there's um, solid liquid gas. So it's a fourth state of matter, solid liquid gas, plasma. It used to be called ether. So I was a, a philosophy major. So in philosophy, I was always reading about ether. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, I'm like, where did the ether go? <laughs> well, actually, they took it out of science about 400 years ago. They removed the concept. So everything would stay material, solid liquid gas. So um, so plasma, um, there's a book by Robert Temple called the, A New Science of Heaven, where he talks about these vast plasma clouds that um, lie outside of Earth, three times bigger than Earth. So um, 
there's also something called the Great Sloan Wall that's, I think, 137, 167 light years away from Earth that's also affecting Earth. So these plasma clouds, as well as this Great Sloan Wall, they're affecting Earth because Earth is also has this, not just the sun is plasma, but the Earth also has a plasma quality. And so I started thinking, because I'd written a lot about DNA in my books and researched it a lot. And I'm like, oh, so now we have like 90 some percent of DNA is junk DNA. So what if that's plasma? Like what if my DNA is plasma? I just did a podcast with Randall Carlson. I don't know if yeah. you know him. And we <laughs> talked about yeah. plasma and these new yeah. machines that they're right. working on that can use plasma as energy. Like to well, a power lot of people that see orbs they're seeing actual um, mechanical plasma, mechanical um, activity is what they're seeing. Mm. But the thing about plasma is it's, it's, it's like DNA. So DNA is self-assembling. So your DNA self-assembles. That's why the mRNA shot, that, that was put in to help our DNA self-assemble with it, okay? So it becomes something different, okay? So plasma self-assembles, but it also communicates and is intelligent. So, so I birth babies, right? So that's another thing that transhumanists want to take away. They want to take away natural reproduction. Okay. When I, as a woman, carry this child inside of me, by virtue of that, I have my every one of my children's DNA inside my body. And my children have my DNA inside of their body. So there's automatically set up a communication system. My DNA is communicating back and forth within my child's body and within my body. It's a communication system. It's a telepathic system. Now, what if we, that's a micro system. Jeff, like, what if we then move that out into a bigger system out into the universe with these plasma clouds? What if these plasma clouds are one of the places where our consciousness is naturally going, not cyborg going, naturally going and collecting information? Well, maybe that's how the communication can take place between yeah. CE5 or CE6 mm -hmm. is through that route. Have you um, read much or had Alana Freeland on your show? I have not. And to tell you honestly, since I do a daily show, I don't even have much time to read. And I feel I get it. bad for authors because I can't read their books. I just don't have yeah, time. She's done some just amazing work. So um, my exoconscious, so we have exoconscious coaching groups. I've got three right now. They're very small. And we work through um, a curriculum and that everybody talks. It's So there's a structure to it. But um, one of the groups got very, very interested in orbs. Like, what's a metaphysical orb? Or, you know, and then we went into Alana Freeland's work on chemtrails and orbs and mechanical and mechanical orbs and um, orb weaponry and how that's all part of where we are right now in the advancement of, of technology. So um, it's like, you're seeing an orb or you're doing a CE5. That's one of the things that's always bothered me. Like, are you looking at a man-made technology that's plasma? And if so, that's fine, but that's a man-made plasma. It's too bad that if it is going into the, in the direction of weaponry. You know, Carol Rosen, no, I she's need to. The one that did the Warner von Braun. I've heard of the name. Yeah, she's the one that came out. She worked with Warner von Braun in the space program, and she said, you know, first there's going to be, a, you know, um, Cold War, nations of concern, terrorists, and then you know the final card is going to be the ET attack. Mm -hmm. You know, von Braun told her that's the direction they're going in in space weaponry. Mm -hmm. And you know, I. I'm as concerned about weapons in space 
which is, you know, all part of the whole satellite array and, you know, that the rod of God technology. And that's all pl a lot of plasma technology. That's what it is. And um, but I'm also not just concerned about that. I'm just very, very concerned about and, and I care about deeply about just the preservation of human consciousness, natural human consciousness. I mean, if we're going to give up our meridians and our chakras and our astral body and our, you know, our emotional body and our, you know, physical, but like, do you really want to give that up? Like, what are you thinking? Do, and and the and the and the pity of it is, we're just on the precipice of figuring out what that we don't even know what DNA is. And so we have something called the Exoconscious Bill of Humans Bill of Rights. Do you think there's an ET influence that's pushing people into transhumanism? One of the few malevolent ones that may be out there? Um, well, certainly, you know, I'm not a Rudolf Steiner. Do you know Rudolf Steiner? I'm not a Rudolf Steiner scholar. But, you know, a hundred years ago, Rudolf Steiner said that there was a being called Armon, and this Armonic being was actually in a hundred years, which is today, was going to be capturing um, human minds and human souls and putting them in the um, what's called the eighth sphere, where they kept reincarnating back as um, cyborgs. Um, I, I actually. Um, wow. I think that um, I think realistically, what's going to happen is that much of the human race is going to go cyborg because it's easy. They can play their video games. They can be on their phone. They can get their implants. Um, they're going to go. They can they can fit in, and um, much of the human race will go cyborg. But much of the human race will not go cyborg that they'll be kind of like, um, we'll be sort of living as a natural human. Um, those who exoconscious humans who are communicating with these different dimensions of themselves, because it always starts inside, communicating with different dimensions of myself, I'm committed outward into the universe with different dimensions, that, um, that they'll be, it's almost like living uh, alongside another species. Do you think that if you do go the route of cyborg, Neuralink, that you're going to sacrifice your psychic ability? Yes. It's a trade-off. I, I think you're going to sacrifice a lot more than your psychic ability. I mean, the military DARPA was already running experiments on, quote, religious extremists. Um, during the first Middle East war, so now I guess we're in Middle East war point three, I guess. Um, that, you know, how do we identify the neural um, pathways of a religious extremist, them identifying as Muslim or religious extremists, terrorists, or however they labeled them. So they, they were already then, what's that been? 20 years, they've been identifying um, those pathways and um, working on that. So yes, I think um, you, you would lose a lot of connection to God, to source, to your soul. Yeah. Well, if you think we become two species, what do you think the relationship would be like between the two? Difficult. Very difficult. But not insurmountable. It kind of reminds me of Star Wars. We have the dark side of the force and the light side. And it's very interesting because, you know, you look at the consciousness, you look at the consciousness community, you look at somebody like Dean Radin that worked for um, Edgar's, Edgar Mitchell's um, IONS, Institute of Noetic Sciences. And he's done all this research on people that, you know, meditate and different states of consciousness and whatever. And he's chosen to go um, into transhumanism. He, he, co-founded a group called um, Cognogenesis, where they do CRISPR DNA, they cut up in the back of your head and they go in and they um, snip, snip your DNA to change it. That's amazing that he went in that direction. I think that's the tip of the iceberg. 
I'm not even sure how that would work. Like the Neuralink thing, like how hooking the internet. Well, because there's going to be so much money. It's sort of like, um, so, so now culturally, um, I'll put my therapist hat on. So now culturally we'll, we're living in this era of extreme confusion. So, um, all of the threats say, you know, the war threat and that terrorist threat and, you know, Friday the 13th, be careful, there's going to be, a, they've already got everybody all ramped up. So when you get all ramped up into this, you're actually swinging between um, uh, testosterone on one side and cortisol on the other, and you're just swinging back and forth. Well, the thing about swinging is that it equals confusion. So you don't know how to get yourself settled down you don't know how to how to um, think straight. Okay, so there's going to be, I mean, just you know, look at the cities and the fentanyl and the and the, and the amount of just phone usage, games usage, you know, disconnect from nature. So if you keep everybody in a state of chronic mental health, is how I would label it. So our culture is moving to a state of chronic mental health. Then. Um, you're going to, and you know, you know that the old, uh, the, the volumes and the, you know, well, butrin or whatever, that's kind of run its course. So like the next thing, we're going to give you a neural link or we're going to give you a little CRISPR DNA in the back of the head. You're going to do just fine. There's going to be so much <laughs> money in that, Jeff. Yeah. So much money. I can't even tell you. Well, I think some of those people argue that AI and or robots are going to get so powerful that we have to go in that direction or go mm -hmm. and become obsolete oh, or yeah, potentially that's eliminated. That's the propaganda. Don't you love it? It's propaganda. All AI is, is, um, so I was talking to somebody the other day and they were saying, oh, you know, I'm using chat GPT for all of my you know, all of my coaching and my writing. And I'm like, I said, all you're doing is making yourself stupid. Like, why would you want to do? Oh, no, no, I'm, I, I said, no, no, you're not. I said, you're just scraping that right off and sticking that where you're going to stick it. And, and so the thing we have to realize about an AI system, and an AI system is built upon stealing. Okay. It scrapes every book I wrote. It scrapes every book everybody else wrote. It scrapes everybody's research. It it steals. So there's no respect for human sovereignty, for human property or human sovereignty. Period. It's a it's a system of theft. And then you lay that on top of it, then you have these algorithms that are nothing but a system of propaganda. So not only will I steal things, but then I'll go in and choose which the ones I want to use for my narrative. So then I'll just make up lies and I'll tell them to humans. The one thing I learned about AI and transhumanism, it's all built on a closed loop, zeros and ones, closed loop. And you just run around, that's the hamster wheel. That's the simulation. You wanna be in the simulation? Just jump right in there. What it doesn't have, it doesn't have the ability to, so, so we've talked about integration, we've talked about co-creation. The third, the third and fourth pieces of, of exoconsciousness is, is creative thinking and critical thinking. Okay, like I'm being lied to, I know that. I'm being lied to. These algorithms are just making stuff up or not letting me know things. And I know for a fact, because of my research, the major news services have used AI to write their news for over 10 years. And get this, the research I used in my book and I footnoted it, it's been scraped off. It's not there anymore. So it's a lie. What do you mean it's not there anymore? You can't find the references. Oh. They're gone. Get rid of that reference. It's just act like it's brand new, chat GPT, brand new. <laughs> I thought that AI would also encompass computers becoming self-aware. Oh, sentient technology? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're aware because they're built with our consciousness. They're built with our knowledge. 
But what they don't have is that, once again, it's a closed system, okay, zeros and ones. It doesn't have that, what we've been talking about, that ability of the human consciousness, of the human heart, of the human mind to go out beyond into the field of consciousness and bring in new information. So you look at any, so you you look at look at China. Um, if, if, if you look at the development of China, when communism came in, everything got shut down, okay? Closed system, no innovation. All the innovation that China had amazing in, in innovation before that. The minute communism came down, all the innovation shut down because the creativity was shut off. You shove humans into a closed system and you're just turning off the creativity valve and you're turning off the creative thinking valve because you're going to determine what information within the human realm is out there. So people are going to have to go out beyond that AI realm to find their information. Would you say then so they're going to need syn synchronicity? Would you say then that within that closed system, free will will disappear? It will disappear because people have given it up. It will be a default. I've defaulted and I've given it up. So really, Jeff, what we're talking about here is we're talking about humans allowing themselves to emerge in a way that they've never emerged before. Yeah, just giving up their control. Yeah. yeah. And I think just like with Dr. Mitchell, where we worked on zero point energy, consciousness, the extraterrestrial presence. If all you see, so, so, so for example, when I was in DC, I, it was very clear to me that all these transhumanists, all they did was they saw brain. They just, you know, that started back in 2000 with George Bush. So George Bush started the, the Bush Brain Initiative, okay? He was going to map the brain, okay? And at the same time, the Genome Project launched also under Bush. Well, now the Genome Project was a huge success, right? Bush's Brain Project, not so much. So when Obama came in, he started the Obama Brain Initiative. <laughs> But he used the templates, some of the templates from the Genome Project, okay? And then they began to, you know, get some traction and move forward with, with mapping the brain. So for, for a transhumanist or a material scientist, that brain mapping equals consciousness. You mentioned earlier about people reincarnating over and over as cyborgs trapped and sometimes on the podcast here we talk about even just this reality is potentially a trap already of reincarnating over and over again what are your thoughts on that um i think that reincarnation is something that we really don't understand i think there's you know the professor at university of virginia in charlottesville that did a lot of studies of the children that, you know, reincarnated, remember their reincarnation. I think we're just really in this, um, a, a lot of this was brought forth by mystery schools. So um, um, Halita Blavinsky and, you know, people like that, the Theosophy Society, they were really the ones that brought in the yoga, they brought in the Theosophical Societies brought in um, reincarnation, ideas of reincarnation, because they, like Steiner, knew that humans are going to be moving into a pretty challenging, intense time. And we have to let them know about these dimensions of consciousness, or they're not going to be able to survive if we don't let this. So they've known this information. They just didn't let it out to you know, worldwide public, public knowledge. And so um, I, I think we don't understand reincarnation. But Jeff, you know, if you just go back and talk to experiencers, then, you know, experiencers, when they talk about 
I've lived on different planets. I've lived on different dimensions. I mean, that sort of belies the reincarnated back again and again and again on this earth plane and what that means, which is another reason why let's get rid of that talk. (laughs) You know, that's going to, that's got, that's a can of worms right there. (laughs) I've had near death experiencers on the other side, wind up in different planets. Yeah. Most commonly they, they go to the water planet. I'm not sure if you're aware of that one. Yeah. The aquatic beings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It makes me also wonder that prior to this life, were you, you know, with a star family and not from Earth? Yeah, totally. It's a big question. Um, so I work a lot in Brazil. I work with a Brazilian community that's led by Juliana Passati, who speaks English. Be a great interview. Um, and um, so when I go to Brazil or I work with um, with the Circle community. Um, they are, they're such a beautiful group of people. So they're professionals, for example, they're doctors, there's nurses, they're engineers, there's, they're, they're business professionals. And at night they take their consciousness and their, their heart and their soul, and they, they become healers and they heal poor people. Mm, That's great. And so I was taken back into a back room. Um, at one of their healing clinics and they they were scientifically uh, forming a database around the healing that was happening in the room and one of the women was um, healing with the aquatic beings Hmm. person on the table what are some practical tips that you can give my audience to become more exoconscious you have to um, heal yourself you have to, when you start to heal yourself, that is kind of like you're sort of like ripping that bandage off. The more you rip the bandage off the wound and you allow some air to get to that wound and that wound to heal, your own personal self-trust begins to strengthen. When you say heal yourself, what do you mean? Like some type of therapy or... Or just looking at your life in the past. So exoconsciousness is you're just becoming conscious of things that you don't want to admit about yourself or things that you don't want to see in yourself or or realities that you don't want to admit exist. So you become very avoidant. Most people that are wounded are avoidant. So they're trying to run off and go, I'm going to go meditate. I'm going to go astral project. No, you're not. You're just avoiding you got a lot of work to do. It's like, no, I want to run out and play. No, <laughs> you know, parents, may I come back here? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, so you start to bring to conscious awareness the parts of yourself that you haven't wanted to look at. It's as simple as that. Makes sense. We'll be... so I would say, number one, do that. As you're doing that, become aware that you you trust yourself because if you're avoiding yourself and you're avoiding these parts of yourself that you need to take responsibility for, then you don't trust yourself because you're still lying to yourself. And once you start to trust yourself, once again, we're going in, we're going in deep, And then we're integrating and then we're moving out. So if I trust myself, then I have an entirely different criteria of whether or not I trust those beings that I'm coming into contact with on multidimensional levels. And I can approach them with myself being responsible and having some, uh, uh, having human control over this. And not just being a victim. Besides exoconsciousness coaching, you also have a YouTube channel called Exoconsciousness Humans TV. What kind of content are you posting there? So right now, um, thanks for mentioning it. Um, so right now, Exoconscious Humans TV primarily posts um, um, very interesting interviews with people that are in the coaching groups. 
So I'll just give you an example of one of the women because it's it's such a it's such a it's such an interesting example. So she came to the group and she came in as an adult experiencer. She'd been having these, you know, synchronistic things happen, messages coming in, seeing orbs, you know, all of the usual, you know, checklists that I'm sure you've heard, Jeff. And she saw herself as this, this um, um, adult experiencer, very confused. If, if I hear it once, I hear it every week. I thought I was going crazy. <laughs> And so as she stayed in the group and we we worked through a curriculum from, you know, birth through adulthood. And and as she stayed in the group, so she's been in the group almost about a year now. Well, about six months in, she goes, you know what? She goes, when I was a little girl, five years old, I was up in, in uh, Snowflake, um, Arizona, and I was back in that forest where Travis Walton was, and I got picked up by a craft five years before Travis Walton. And she started bringing forth this amazing memory of what had happened to her. That had she not been in the group and not been around people that she could talk to, she would have never remembered that maybe. I don't know. But she intentionally decided to give it, get in there and work with it. And now, um, you know, she's working with Kevin Briggs who channels the council of eight and is getting messages from the council of eight. What else are you working on that you want us to know about? <laughs> so because of Edgar, uh, well, well, first of all, I do not just group coaching, but I also do one-on-one. -on -one. I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching with people because just kind of just to dig in there with people. Um, so, but my work with Edgar, I've always felt that, and one of the things we didn't talk about, but I was, I was, I've been involved with exopolitics since like the early 2000s, like Stephen, Stephen Bassett and Victor Vigiani. And, and I, I, I determined some time into that, probably five or 10 years into that. I started working with Edgar and I, I began to see after working with him because I could see things being shut down all the time. You know, they're just not allowed to, to come to the public view. And so that's why I turned my work to exoconsciousness because I thought I'm not going to spend the rest of my life hoping and praying that the intelligence community, which are basically paid liars, not that they don't do other things, but you know, many of the agents are paid to be deceitful, to get information. That's their job. That I wasn't going to spend my life hoping and praying that the government or the intelligence or the military or a military contractor was going to give me the information. And so I turned my focus to exoconscious humans because I truly believe that if zero point energy or the new inventions, the new consciousness technology that's coming forward, if that's going to manifest on Earth freely, it's going to manifest through exoconscious humans, through co-creation with extraterrestrials. So that's where I'm putting my energy. You don't have another book that you're working on? <laughs> Not right now. And right now, I'm really um, one of the interesting things that so I'm working with inventors, you know, still always this, you know, my work with Edgar. Edgar is very present. Edgar gets channeled into our group a lot. So he's he's very present with our group. And I'm also um, we're also bringing together these cohorts of people that have different kinds of abilities. So communication abilities, tech abilities, um, dowsing abilities. Earth energy worker ability, Reiki healers, um, astrologers, bringing them all together around certain topics and um, kind of just doing multi multidisciplinary approaches to understanding what's happening. So um, one of the places we're doing that is in Hawaii with that situation in Maui, what's happened there. Um, another is the uh, the whole eclipse, the X that's coming over America. So yeah, I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of excitement there because it's 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 looking at things not only 
it's looking at issues as a multidimensional human, recognizing that other people in a community bring multidimensional perspectives that I and they all need. I know this sounds simple, but if a person would just recognize that they are multidimensional beings, that will make significant changes within. Yeah. But that, as you said, that's also being going against the grain. Like, I, I really believe when we were talking about Rudolf Steiner and the, the, the sort of the, the eighth sphere and being co caught in this circle of the eighth sphere and reincarnating back in Earth as a cyborg again and again and again, which may happen. I don't know. May happen. You know, the exoconscious humans who say that that's not the path they want, they don't want to go down that path. Well, if they don't want to go down that path, they're going to have to develop a spiritual spine that's very different than they've ever had on Earth before. Well, after watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you up for it? And if so, how should they contact you? Um, just go to my website, exoconsciousness.com. And um, there's a contact link there. And you can, you know, personally contact me or you could email me. It's just r, r for Rebecca, Rebecca Hardcastle, right at gmail.com. Easy. Well, Rebecca, before we wrap it up, can you leave us with one last positive message? I feel like um, we are going into probably the one, one of the most challenging eras for humans in which we're going to um, not only individually, but also as communities begin to develop advanced abilities spiritually, mentally, psychically that we have never um, possessed before as humans. Rebecca, thank you for that message. And thank you for being my guest. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.